Hello, men. Welcome back to our weekly Bible study through the book of Matthew. What a great study. What a challenging chapter 18 has been as it's caused us to look inward at our own behavior. We don't have any formal announcements today, but I want to encourage you guys to invite other men out to our study so they too can know the greatness of the stu of studying about our Savior this year. No better way to spend your time than diving deep with Jesus. I also wanted to mention that I loaded up a word study video by Dr. Ken on the stone of stumbling and his pre-lecture video on chapter 18. Both videos are really good, and I wanna recommend watching both. They're relatively short, and they complement this week's lecture. Now, if you've been blessed by our study so far, please subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share the video. Now, let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your grace towards us. Let us never take for granted the great opportunity it is to come together and do a Bible study. We know the time spent doing this study is not in vain. You use every moment and every situation to continue to shape us into the men you desire us to be. So we give you this time to work out of us the things that grieve you and pour into us the things that bring you glory. In Christ's powerful name, amen. Before we get started, let me ask you guys a question. If you were going to start a movement, who would be the essential guys on your team? I'm sure everyone's list would be a little bit different, but there would be some common themes. Like you would need a guy with money. And lots of money would be helpful because it's costly to underwrite a movement. But you also need a really smart guy because it helps when you have the answer man on your team. Also, you need a good looking guy because our world is superficial and people tend to want to follow a good looking leader. And lastly, you need a famous guy. Someone that is a household name because people love it when their leaders are icons. But what if you could find a rich, genius, good-looking, famous guy all rolled into one? Well, then you got yourself a leader that most people would flock to and give their allegiance. But wait a minute. This sounds very secular. This is a Bible study. What does God look for? That's an interesting question. Did you know God is on a search for men with the right heart? Do you remember when Samuel went to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king? Samuel, he couldn't figure out which son to anoint. And God told Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Second Chronicles 6, 16, 9 says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. A paraphrase of Ezekiel 2230 says, the Lord looks for those who will stand in the gap. God is on a search for people whose heart is right. He knows what he's looking for and he isn't lowering his standard. This week, the disciples' hearts needed a tuna so their hearts would be better aligned with the father's heart so we will divide this week's passage into two division matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 20 unexpected standard of humility and our second division is matthew chapter 18 verses 21 through 35 unexpected standard of forgiveness as we head into our first division, unexpected standard of humility. Let's look back at a slide that we're familiar with, the literary structure of Matthew. As you may recall, when we have talked about this slide in the past, the book of Matthew is structured in a chiasm form. Remember, a chiasm structure 
It's like a mountain peak, but it's laying on its side. The red arrows point out where we are in the pattern. Chapter 18 is Jesus's fourth teaching and his last teaching in the Galilee area. I have the word love as the subtitle of the teaching. Now, our teaching tonight is about humility and forgiveness. So why do I mention love? Please watch Dr. Ken's short pre-lecture video on chapter 18, and you will see how love links chapter 17 and chapter 18 together, and how love undergirds our humility and forgiveness. So visit our YouTube channel and check out Dr. Ken's videos. As we move into the chapter, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, to understand why the disciples asked this question, you need to look at the gospel accounts in Mark and Luke, where on the walk back from Caesarea Philippi, the disciples were arguing who was going to be the greatest. The disciples' question revealed their hearts and betrayed their thoughts. Were they thinking that following Jesus was going to lead them to a place of privilege, ruling, and status, rather than becoming servants? This question opens the door to enable Jesus to teach the disciples about true greatness and the role servanthood is in, in this role of servanthood in his coming kingdom. Now, Jesus could have simply said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you better be humble. But instead, Jesus is a master teacher who uses parables and illustrations to make a lasting impression. In verse 2, Jesus uses a child as an illustration. As he says, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. In classic Jesus style, he says something that makes you stop and say, what does he mean? To, understand, to help us understand, it's important to notice two words that Jesus uses, change and become. These two words point out the necessity of a conversion. While the disciples were maneuvering for first place in the kingdom, Jesus said, unless they change, there wasn't a place for them in the kingdom. This would have been a shock to the disciples, egos, which Jesus needed to clear the fog of greatness out of their minds and have them focus on what does it mean to be great in the kingdom. Well, in a word, humility. Having childlike humility is the key to understanding what Jesus is saying. Children are dependent and trust those who provide for them. And they respond to those who have authority over them as they are teachable and pliable. So just to be clear, Jesus isn't saying he wants us to be childlike in our maturity or knowledge, but instead, Jesus desires us to have childlike faith. That's faith that is trusting and focuses on others. Even though Jesus had recently explained to the disciples how he would be betrayed, killed, and raised after three days, somehow their thoughts drifted to visions of greatness. When they should have been focused on God the Father's plan for Jesus and the upcoming trip to Jerusalem and what it meant that Jesus would be killed and raised. I don't want to be too hard on the disciples because often we can get our focus off of Jesus and on ourselves. The ugly truth is each one of us, due to our fallen nature, are rebels who want to, who want to be celebrities instead of servants. Our social media indicts us of how much we promote ourselves and our own agendas. But Jesus is saying that his father's heart for us is to, is to be humble servants, having the characteristics of an unspoiled child, trustful, dependent, 
which is what is meant by lowly position in verse four. Now, verse five is interesting. Let me read it. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Jesus in this verse links our treatment of others, especially the lowly, to our relationship with him. We aren't to Matthew chapter 25 yet, but let's look what Jesus says in Matthew 25, 40. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is a sobering message. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not sure if I always live up to this standard. I hate to admit it, but sometimes I overlook the needy and I keep on going about my day. And that's why we need chapter 18. Jesus' words force us to look inward at our behavior. So it's just not the disciples who were on the hot seat, but it's us too. Humility is not a natural virtue, but comes from God working on us as he continues to sanctify us. Moving on to verses six through nine, Jesus is going to talk about stumbling blocks and the consequences of being a stumbling block as it relates to sin. Just to get a feel for Jesus's seriousness on the matter of stumbling, let's read verse six. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. After reading this verse, a question comes up in my mind. What did Jesus mean by little ones? Is he talking about children or people who are young in their faith? Or maybe both. When studying the Bible, it's helpful to let the Bible interpret the Bible. So to get a better understanding of little ones, turn back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus tells us that it is a serious matter because anyone who believes in him to sin or to lead him astray. The BSF attribute this week is jealous. And Jesus is jealous for those who believe in him. And if you cause one of his to stumble, there will be a divine payment required, which will be worse than having a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. The world is comfortable with the lovable Jesus, but Jesus is also about divine justice, and Jesus doesn't give sin a pass. In verses 8 and 9, Jesus shifts from outward stumbling blocks to inward stumbling blocks. And these stumbling blocks we're familiar with, our feet, hands, and eyes. Verse 8 says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. How are we to understand what Jesus is saying? Obviously, Jesus is using hyperbole to point out how radical our attitude should be about eliminating sin in our lives and how we should value holiness and purity in our lives. But what are we to do in this generation when some of our churches have stopped talking about sin and have embraced sinful lifestyles? Unfortunately, justifying sin or blurring the lines between obedience and sin has caused some of us to become too comfortable with sin in our lives. It's interesting that Jesus' illustration, our feet, hands, and eyes, way too often our feet takes us places we shouldn't go. And we use our hands to touch things we shouldn't be touching. And we use our eyes for looking at things we shouldn't be looking at. Obviously, feet, hands, and eyes are a blessing from God. But if they lead you into a sinful lifestyle, they're not a blessing. So what Jesus is talking about here is self-examination and self-denial. And that takes humility 
on our part. Jesus is instructing us to perform spiritual surgery on ourselves, removing anything that causes us to stumble or that causes others to stumble. The truly humble man lives for Christ first and then others. A humble man puts himself in the backseat. Humble men build others up and are stepping stones and are not stones of stumbling. Moving on in the chapter, Jesus demonstrates how humility leads to caring for others through the parable of the wandering sheep. Jesus uses the parable to reveal his father's heart toward each one of his children. In the parable, a sheep has wandered off and is in danger of being lost and is in peril by potential wolves nearby. The shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to do what it takes to rescue this sheep, which is an example of how the father will pursue us to rescue us when we wander from him. So we see the father's heart through this parable. And so if we are to reflect the father's heart, we should have a heart for the lost. We should, like a good shepherd, be willing to do what it takes to bring the lost back. I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with the term, the providence of God. Being a simple guy, I like to think of God's providence is when God uses life circumstances and situations to accomplish his will for our lives. Now, keeping that in mind, we know God pursues the sinner to bring them back. But how does he do that? Well, God has many methods, but one, but one way is he will use someone like you <laughs> to go after the wandering sinner. This concept leads us into the final section in this division, and that is church discipline, verses 15 through 20. Just mentioning the phrase church discipline makes some of us squirm as we envision the sin police hiding between the pews at our churches. So let's proceed cautiously into verses 15 through 20 as we see what truths Jesus wants his disciples and us to know. Let's read the beginning of verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Now, some Bible translations might say sins against you, but I like how the NIV translates it because in reality, as humble servants, we should take the focus off of ourselves and remember that all sin is against God. And when we do that, we realize that the sinner is like the wandering sheep and God is nudging us to go after to go and help the sinner get back onto the narrow path. Because each child of God is of infinite value to the Father, our role is to go to the rescue and, and to the and the one of the way, and one of the ways Jesus has prescribed us to do that is through confrontation. You turn your attention to the screen. In verses 15 through 17, Jesus has given us a four-step method to confront a sinner in the church. Hopefully the flow chart or diagram on the screen is helpful and hasn't overly complicated the four-step process Jesus laid out for us. Let's take a moment and just step through it. Now, we can spend all night on these verses alone discussing this section of scripture, but time and our BSF format do not allow for that in-depth of a discussion. The BSF notes do cover it in more detail, so please read the notes to get a deeper understanding. So when you see a Christian brother or sister who is a part of the church sin, what do you do? Well, you have three choices. You can ignore it, which is what most people do, or you can tell someone else about it, which leads you into the sin of gossip, or you can allow God to use you to confront the sinner, the wandering sheep, in hopes they are restored to a right relationship 
with God. That's step one. If the sinner doesn't heed the warning, you are to take another person or two people with you and confront the sinner again. The end goal of all of this is restoration of the sinner. This is step two. If the sinner still refuses to repent and turn away from their pattern of sin, confront the sinner with official church leadership. If the sinner repents, great. Restoration has taken place. This is step three. But if not, the church is to treat the unrepentant sinner as you would a pagan or tax collector. The sinner would be put outside of the local body of believers. But the church members would continue to try to win the sinner back to God, like he would an unbeliever. This is step four. Now, if this sounds harsh, it's probably because when it's been tried, it may have been poorly executed. Or unrepentant sinners don't like hearing that they are being called out for their exposing their sin in the church. But just as a comparison, compare how our woke culture treats those individuals who commit a sin in their eyes. If you express a non-politically correct viewpoint or have an opinion that is counterculture, the social media mob comes in masses and ruthlessly tries to destroy you. The end goal is not restoration, but to crush you and essentially cancel you. Even old historical figures are not safe from the cancel culture mob. They drag your sins into the public square until you have been completely defeated and canceled. I'd much rather be approached by a humble, compassionate fellow church member about my sin with the end goal of restoration than the social media mob. Jesus' four-step approach to restoring a brother needs to be taken seriously. Jesus didn't give us an alternative method. If we try to love our brother and care for him, godly relationships are of extreme importance to the father's heart. It grieves God to see his children suffer from broken relationships due to sin. Jesus knows church discipline is not easy, and because of that, we will be tempted to shy away from it. So in, so in verses 19 through 20, Jesus encouraged us by saying, which this is my paraphrase, when you're in a difficult work of church discipline, when two or three of you are gathered with a brother who is living in unrepentant sin, and you're doing the tough work of gentle, loving confrontation, be assured of this. My presence, which is always with you, will be real, strong, and felt in the middle of that situation. Be assured you will experience my presence in a unique and powerful way. But let's back up to verse 18. What did Jesus mean when he talked about the binding and loosening? It sounds very similar to what Jesus said to Peter back in chapter 16. So picture the sinner at step four, when the church asked the repentant sinner to leave the body of believers. The sinner might say, who gives you the authority to remove me? Well, then the church can say, Jesus gives us the authority to remove and reinstate people from fellowship within the church body. But the church doesn't have the authority to depart from scripture. And that's the connection between earth and heaven in the verse. Our authority comes from heaven, but the church can't go beyond what heaven has declared through the scriptures. And because of this linkage, the church reflects the will of God the Father and his heart. Which brings us to our first principle. Believers reflect the Father's heart through humble actions. Believers reflect the Father's heart through humble actions. Why is it so easy to think too highly of ourselves? Why do we tend to focus on self and not others? While the disciples had visions of greatness, Jesus needed them to be more like a child 
who are trainable and teachable. Jesus needed humble disciples, which means they had to think of others before themselves. But an occupational hazard of focusing on others is you might witness them sinning. Then what do you do? When confrontation and church discipline arise, often we opt ahead in the other direction, or we punt and let someone else deal with it. But Jesus didn't give us that option. God might be using you providentially to bring a lost sheep back to the fold. So let me ask you, where is God calling you to lift up the overlooked in our culture? How do you respond when you're confronted about your sin? As we head into the second division, unexpected standard of forgiveness, Peter asked the question that we're all thinking about. How many times must we go through this four-step process to restore a sinner back into the community of believers? Forgiving others, particularly if a sin is repeated, is not easy. It can be a real challenge without God's help. And Peter knows it, and so do we. But through verses 21 through 35, Jesus will show us God's grace and how it's ridiculous to withhold forgiveness from those who sin against us. But how far must we go? In verse 21, Peter asks Jesus if there is a limit on forgiveness. When he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? who sins against me up to seven times? According to the BSF notes, the rabbis taught the limit of forgiveness was three times. And now Peter is raising the bar to seven, which seems reasonable to the new believer. It was more than double of what the rabbis were teaching. But once again, in verse 22, Jesus responds with an unexpected answer as he says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. The point Jesus is making is clear. Love keeps no record, records of wrongs. So don't think about counting when faced with the need to extend forgiveness. The point of our forgiveness of others is that it should be unlimited because the grace of God towards us has no limits. But what do you guys think about Jesus's reference to 77 times? Do you think Jesus did some quick Messiah math? Or do you think there is a biblical connection to that number? Remember back to our Genesis study last year, and in chapter four, verse 24, the evil Lamach's vengeance would be 77 times. Essentially, Jesus was taking Lamach's limit of revenge and turning it into a principle of forgiveness. Now, to make sure the disciples were getting the deep truth of forgiveness, Jesus illustrates the principle with a powerful parable in verses 23 through 35. In it, the main character, who is the servant of a king, experiences three facets of forgiveness as a debtor as a creditor and as a prisoner in verses 23 through 27 we encounter the servant as a debtor whose debt is colossal scholars have calculated that it is an amount of money that could never be repaid and we get that 10,000 bags of gold but he actually thought that given enough time He could actually repay the king, but his situation was hopeless, except for one thing. The king had overwhelming compassion and mercy. The king wrote off his debt and forgave him, although he didn't deserve it. The picture drawn for us here is clear. In Christ, we have received God's extravagant mercy because we had a debt we couldn't pay. From the beginning, the Father's heart has always been to give life and love to his creation. He seeks out those who are lost, alone, hurting, and in need. He's compassionate, and his desire is to forgive and to restore. 
The father's heart is full of mercy. Out of sheer compassion and mercy, the father sent his son to endure the wrath that you and I deserve. And now we are free from the penalty of sin. So since we've received the father's extravagant mercy, what should we do? In verses 28 through 30, we're now shown the servant as a creditor who was owed an insignificant amount, 100 silver coins, by a fellow servant. But the forgiven servant, instead of sharing with his friend the joy of his own release, the servant mistreated his friend and demanded that he repay the debt. The unjust servant was unwilling to grant to others what had been granted to him. Finally, in verses 31 through 34, the servant became a prisoner. The servant pursued the course of justice and cast his friends, his friend into prison for his unpaid minor debt. But when the king heard, heard about this, his response was, so you want to live by justice? Then you shall have justice. I will do to you as you've done to others. And the servant was thrown into prison. The parable powerfully teaches us that the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. If we refuse to forgive others, then we are only imprisoning ourselves and causing our own torment. I say torment, but do you know the emotional pain associated with holding on to unforgiveness causes? Anger, bitterness, depression, broken relationships. In verse 35, Jesus emphasizes that his father's heart is one of forgiveness and ours must be too. So what do you call it when God slowly changes our hearts to be humbler and forgiving to others? Well, it's called the doctrine of sanctification, which is the BSF doc doctrinal focus this week. So please read your notes about this very encouraging doctrine. It's great to know that God is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to changing us from the inside out. But let me just say this. What happens when we don't believe in the doctrine of sanctification? We see life circumstances, joys, and challenges as random events. We fail to notice God's deeper work happening inside of us. But when we believe that God actively uses anything and everything we face to sanctify us and accomplish his purifying work, we stop resisting what is hard and as we embrace what God is doing in us and for his glory. Which brings us to our second principle. Believers reflect the Father's heart through forgiving actions. Believers reflect the Father's heart through forgiving actions. I'm sure you guys have heard it said that Christians should be, more, should be the most forgiving people because we've been forgiven the most. But what is the flip side to that statement? If a person fails to pass on forgiveness, are people who just don't understand God's grace or divine forgiveness might be because they've never received divine forgiveness. When people refuse to forgive, they lock themselves in a prison cell of their own making. The irony of this truth is the prisoner holds the key to the cell of unforgiveness, but often refuses to use it. So let me ask you, who is God calling you to forgive and extend mercy to? What is preventing you from forgiving like Christ. In, in summary, the big takeaway this week, the world needs Christians who reflect the Father's heart. No one is more forgiving and humble than God. Don't let your pride get in the way of humbly extending forgiveness and mercy to a bitter and self-focused world. As God molds you to look more like Christ, the world will notice your birthmarks of humility and forgiveness. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us in our groups and give us boldness to be transparent in our sharing. Reveal to us this week 
who he might still be holding a grudge against, so we can extend forgiveness to them. As the psalmist says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offense, offensive way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. In Christ's name, amen.